If you have your Bibles, uh, stand with us in honor of reading God's Word. I'm going to be reading up 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 18. If it's all right with you, I'm going to read a lot this morning. And I'm going to get into chapter 2 and probably take the first five verses of chapter 2. So let's, uh, let's, let's pray that we hear what God's Word has to say from Him personally to us personally. Verse number 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to, those, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the, of the wise. Isn't that a strong word? Destroy the wisdom of the wise. Bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. That's my sermon. The foolishness of the message preached. But praise God, God's able to even use somebody like me. Verse 22. For Jews require, request a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block. To the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man. The weakness of God is stronger than man. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many mobile, noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. Why? That no flesh should glory in his presence. What a powerful statement that is. No flesh. There's nothing about us that can rival the glory of God. He is the only one who deserves the glory and the honor and the praise. Christ alone. Verse 29. Or excuse me, verse 30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God. Not just wisdom, but righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my preaching were not with pers persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not be, should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And if I could add anything, I would simply say, but in the power of God alone. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you. We thank you that when we were in need, you made a way. And Jesus, you didn't just make a way. You are the way. We, you didn't just send us a gift. You sent us the greatest gift that could be given. And you didn't just help us for a moment or one circumstance, or in one situation. But you gave us a gift that would be with us throughout all of eternity. Father, I pray that in the next few moments that your name would be high and lifted up. I pray, Lord, that in the next few moments that you would 
receive the highest praise from us. For Lord, we're not looking for more wisdom, not the way the world gives it. We're not looking for something else to make us more comfortable. Lord, we've sought after enough of that. Lord, my God, my Father, give us Jesus. Help us to fall in love once again. Lord, may nothing rival the King of Kings in our heart. Speak truth, O Lord. Help us to see it plainly and clearly and know. And sir, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory. In your wonderful name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. It's kind of a funny way that this happened, but in the, the next um, five sermons that I preach, I, I got the, the kind of the outline from this in a, in a crazy place. I actually got it from a tombstone, a person who had lived his life in such a way, and this was how he was remembered. And I, I noticed the things that were there, and I thought, what a wonderful way to live. And I don't know what will be thought of me when I leave this place and what will be placed upon my marker. I, I'm not really worried about that because I know where I'll be when others are looking at my marker. But I thought, what a wonderful testimony of, of who God was to this person. And the first one was to know him. And that is actually part of my life verse. My life verse is Philippians 3.10, that I may know him. He goes on to say, in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, be made conformable unto his death. But really, the way, it all begins in this, to know him. And, and church, y'all want to hear from your pastor real quick? This is the goal that I have for my life, and this is the goal that I have for New Holland Baptist Church, that we would know God and we would walk with him. That's everything I want us to do. I want it to be with our eyes fixed and gazing only upon Christ, to know Him, and then just walk with Him the remainders of our days. The, the shorter catechism hundreds of years ago said, it said basically that we are to know God and to enjoy Him forever, and there is a lot of great joy in knowing God. Y'all look up here. This is a face that loves Jesus. This is a face that knows that I am so very blessed and honored to be touched and known by the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That he knows every hair on my head, every thought in my heart, and still loves me and wants more for me than I could ever imagine or understand. When I began to, to think about this this week and God began to do a, a work in my own life, I wrote some things down to know God. You know, you could go anywhere in the world and you could ask the same question and you would get the same reply. Do you know God? And the answer, for the most part, would be yes. There are some humanists that don't believe in a God because literally they look at themselves as gods. And there's others that look at idols or creeds or things and they look at those things as God. But for the most part, people all over the world believe in God, but yet I would ask, what God do they believe in? And I, I just really kind of want to remind you, it's not about religion. Not at all. Not about religion, and it's not about being perfect because none of us are perfect. We're all sinners. We all come short. You're never going to get to a place, this side of glory, where you don't have sins in your life. It's not about that. It's not about being perfect. It's about being saved by a Savior who can do in you only what He can do. It's not about acting religious. It's not about what you do or how you're striving to follow a creed. It's about a relationship. Everything about the Christian life is a relationship. Your worship should come out of a relationship. Your prayer is a relationship. As a matter of fact, how you do what you do and why you do what you do comes out of a relationship with Him. But folks, not everything that's done in the name of religion is a relationship. 
people fly planes into buildings in the name of religion. People starve themselves to death in the name of religion. People marry 11-year-old girls in the name of religion. People drop acid and do drugs in the name of knowing God and religion. People drink poisonous Kool-Aid in the name of religion. People sit in huts on the side of a mountain and do their very best to think of nothing, and they do that in the name of religion. People stick their hands in a box of poisonous snakes in the name of religion, not this preacher. If you want that kind of a Baptist, you're going to have to go some other place, not in this place. I just simply want to say, no wonder so many people are turned off by religion. How many of you have been turned off? by religion. The last couple weeks, I've been surrounded by death. Now folks, I've been in the ministry 35 years. I know about death. I've seen it. I've done funeral services more than I can remember. I've been by the bedside and watched them breathe their last breath. I prayed with family. Pray with family this week. And I'm not saying that in the last 10 days or so that I've seen more death than at other times. Not so. But I believe I've been touched more by it. Or really, I think that, can I just say that I'm going through something in my own personal walk with God that God has used this to, to, to maybe bring me towards what Malachi called the, the refiner's fire. I had a niece, Wednesday a week ago, she breathed her last breath here. She had cancer in the brain. They told her she'd have six months to live, and the doctors at Duke University did so very much for her. She went up there so many times, but after 58 months of battling, as I told everyone, she was healed. She got to not have to deal with the pain and the sorrow and the heartache anymore. But that's not the point. I was talking with Martha, and I will always be touched by how she and Al had to live with what they went through those last couple months. But this is what my niece said two weeks before she died when she had a lucid moment. She said, no one should be more thankful than I am for what God has done for me. From a hospice bed, holding her head because the pain was excruciating, yet from that place she said, no one in all the world should be as grateful as I am. No one should be as thankful as I am for all that God has done for me. And I see so many other people who don't have that attitude. Lynn and I went to a, a funeral of a friend, someone I've known since 1989. And he was a good man. He lived a, a very good life. Worked until the end. He was in his 80s. He was always very kind to other people. But one of the men who spoke at his funeral... Um, he had breakfast with that person many times during the week. Y'all know those restaurants where groups of people go and they have breakfast every day? And, and he was there, and this friend of his, this preacher friend, had asked him this many times, but asking him, asked him this question once again and said, are you ready to go? Do you know that you know? Are you ready to see Jesus? Are you ready to face death? And this was his response. I believe so. Lynn and I left the graveside that day, and we got in my truck, and we had not traveled very far down the road, and she looked over at me, and she said, did that bother you? I said, yes, it did. She said, I have more than I believe so. I know so. Y'all hear me? 
I know in whom I believe. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. Praise God. I don't know that I want to live a I think so, maybe so, I believe so, I don't know. I don't believe I want to live that kind of life. I don't think I want to face eternity with a, a hope. Maybe. Have a pastor, I won't call a friend, an acquaintance that probably has done more for revival in America, his organization that he was president of, of than any person in the last century. And this was his testimony. I heard it this past week. He said that when he was young, a lady came to him and said, your brother just got saved. Don't you want to be saved too? So he walked an aisle and was baptized because this lady told him he needed to go do it. Yet John chapter 6 says that you can't come to know God unless he first draws you, woos you, speaks to you personally. What, what Romans 10 says, that you hear the personal invitation, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, the rhema, the personal invitation from God. This man did not get saved for years later. And by the way, stood up in front of 150 people that were part of this organization that he was running and, and uh, resigned to them because he said that he had allowed his baptism to be on the wrong side of his salvation. He had gotten baptized as a kid but got saved later on. Matter of fact, the, the CEO said, no, 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 you're the kind of person we want leading this organization, somebody who's transparent and honest. But his testimony was before I just did it because this lady told me I needed to do it. Billy Graham, with all the crusade ministry and people coming forward, and he found out from the cards that people filled out that so many people who had come to get saved were already church members. His response was that he, was, he said three-fourths of all church members are probably do not know God. That bothers me if that's the phrase. If that could be in any way true in some way. And by the way, the ones who say that they know God but have no response of this is how I live my life and I, I surrender myself to God and I, I seek to follow him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength and I deny myself and take up my cross and follow him. You know, the, the things that we say in religion and the things that we do sometimes can be very different. You know, if you want to know God, he's not hiding unless you say that he may be hiding around a lot of a religion today. Early one day this week, I was sitting at my kitchen table with this notebook in front of me, and, and I was looking at it, and I began to start thinking about some of the great religious allegiances that people have in this day that they find great value in that I'm not sure God does. Can I just share with you some of the things I thought, began to think about that morning? In the name of Christianity, people argue over, should we drink alcohol or not drink alcohol? Should we get divorced or not get divorced, or remarried or not remarried? Or should we dress in this style, or should we dress in that style? You know, Satan loves to divide, doesn't he? In the name of religion, I'll, I'll read this version, but I won't read that version of the Bible. Or, I believe in being sprinkled, or I believe in being immersed. Or, this person speaks in tongues, and that person doesn't speak in tongues. Or, the leadership of the church, is it supposed to be Elder-led or deacon-led or pastor-led or committee-led or what is it supposed to be? Or are we supposed to meet in the mornings or in the mornings in the evenings or on this day or on that day? Or are we supposed to do discipleship one-on-one -on -one or in a small group or in a big group or on this day or on that day? Or, or do we sing? Do we sing this style or are we supposed to sing that style? Or do we follow 
what some call the old paths, or do we follow new methods? I, I'll be honest with you. In, in staff meeting lately, myself and Rick and Mark, we've been looking at some things, and some of the things that we're, we're looking at and being challenged by are over 300 years old. I'm not chasing old, I'm not chasing new. I'm just telling you that there are people who are divided over such religious allegiances. Should I be a part of a big church or should I be a part of a small church? Which one's right? Should we have pews in the sanctuary or what if we have chairs or should we have screens or should we hold a book? This might shock you, and I'm not exaggerating. Should we pray a sinner's prayer or not? Do people actually have an opportunity to be saved, or is that decided before them for them and they don't really have a choice in the matter? Or as I found out when I was out here by the cross, by the road, under that tent, a man came to me and he didn't share the Word of God with me, but he spoke the Word of God at me and told me how wrong I was for praying for people. And I know these things personally. I've seen them and I've heard them. And you may say, Pastor, I just believe it's this way. I will tell you there are others that believe it's that way. And those are religious creeds. And by the way, on most of these, I've been judged on one side or the other. But I'm not following being popular with you. I'm seeking a relationship with God and being faithful to Him. Yet I I wonder, do we know Him? In the Old Testament, there's, there's these things that we call theophanies. And that's where God would actually show up in the flesh in the Old Testament. He did it with Abraham. He did it with others. In the New Testament, though, I'm I'm talking about after Jesus came to this earth and and lived his life and was crucified on the cross of Calvary and, and, and was buried in the tomb and rose again. The risen person. The Son of God who was the Son of Man. He actually joined himself up with some people who were walking down the road to Emmaus who would have defined themselves as followers of Christ. And they still didn't recognize him. It wasn't until they heard him pray. And then they said, did our hearts not burn within us? Could you imagine, and I wonder, if we get so caught in religion, if Jesus actually entered a church service and sat down, would we recognize him? Would he recognize what is being done in the name of Christ? If that doesn't give you calls to pause. To know him personally. And if you know him then walk with Him. To know Him, so many people are looking for a head knowledge or they want another Bible study so that they can learn more, but they're not living what they already know. Are we experiencing Him? I did this in the first service. I wasn't planning to do it in the first service and I really had not planned on doing it in the second service either, but I I, I just, I promise you there's, Something God's been doing in my heart and in my life. I think you know that. I think you can see that and sense that. But but early in the morning, I sat down and I was writing. And I I, want to tell you, it bothers me when there's part of my life that I'm trying to seek God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. But there's another part of me when I'm trying to hold the hand of God. I'm trying to hold the hand of the world and what pleases Brian. And what brings comfort to Brian? Now, I may be the only one that's that way. But I'll confess to you that I am. 
And I, I wrote this down because I truly want to finish my life living a life of revival. And, and I know I've made this pledge. I don't know that you can see this on my page. It says, read daily. And now I begin when I get up in the morning and I grab my Bible and I go to my quiet place. I take this piece of paper before I do anything else. It says this, repentance. It's a hard attitude that says, everything I know to be sin, or in the future to know it is sin, I will be willing to give it up for Christ. Everything. To know to do sin, to know to do right, not to do it to him it is sin. And I tell you what, I, I'm not there yet, but I don't want any dissonance in my life. I want to make sure that I, I'm not just saying that and preaching a word that I'm not wanting to live. And I want to make sure that there's everything in my life I put under the microscope of the glory of God and that anything that does not honor Him and bring glory into Him, I need to remove it from my life. It's a daily decision. It's a, it's a decision by occurrence. It's a willingness to say yes or no. It's a willingness to say, I will or I will not, depending on the circumstance. And I will say, I want to, I want to say yes or no without any argument whatsoever, without any hesitation, without any self-will, not trying to balance my will and God's will together. And I've made a commitment that I'm going to be in the Word, that I'm going to have a time of prayer, that I'm going to stay away from distractions, that I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God, that, that Brian needs to seek to be humble and speak the truth in love, no matter what, and be a person of love and be an encourager. I want to know him personally. Paul had been in a place called Athens and had uh, preached a sermon. Many people think it's a great sermon. He saw a, a little memorial to the unknown God. He tried to Speak to those people in the place where they would hear new wisdom or new truths. And he tried to preach to them using the wisdom that he had and convey the message why they should accept Christ. And in the process of that, please listen to me, it was the only place in Paul's ministry where a church was not founded. And the very next city that he went to was the city of Corinth. And God did a mighty work in Corinth. God did an amazing work in Corinth. And when he writes this first letter to them, he reminds them of a few things. Chapter 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. They look at it and say, That's, I could never follow that. That's not reasonable. It's foolish. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. He says, for the Jews request a sign. They wanted somebody to prove, show me a sign. The Greeks were looking from some great point of wisdom, he says. But we just preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block, but to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are both Jews and Greeks, Christ, Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. On your best day, on your smartest day, the foolishness of God is bigger. On your day that you're most proud of, that you did the very best job, it still comes up short. It's still 
comes up short. Then he said, hmm. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, so that he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So he said this, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellency of speech. I didn't talk to you in anything. Or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. I think he would almost say this, I tried that and it didn't work. He said, but I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's enough. I'm not preaching a new message. All I have to give you is the cross. All I have to, I can't give you the cross plus anything. And I'm not going to give you the cross minus anything. I'm not going to say to you, it's, it's what Jesus did plus all these other things you've got to do. Those people who took those planes and crashed them in to those buildings, they thought they were doing it in the name of God. They thought that they would be honored to do such things. They thought they'd get 70 virgins. Boy, weren't they surprised. I wonder if God asked that of us Baptists, would we be willing? People who are following that nonsense would do it. But yet sometimes we can't even love someone enough to forgive them. I wonder. I wonder. The two on the road to Emmaus. He was right there, but they didn't know him. You know, I know a whole lot of people. I think there are more people that know me than I know, but this past week when we were talking about the, the funeral that I went to, it was in Danielsville. It's in Madison County. And one guy said, you know, Brian Stevens. said, oh, yeah, I know him. I'm like, I don't know him. I don't have a clue. But there's a lot of times, have you ever walked up and been introduced to someone you know, us guys, we shake hands with them. Five minutes later, I can't even remember their name. Right? Do you know them? Um, well, they're an acquaintance. But I don't really know them. But I said this in the first service. I got a son up there in the balcony right now. I was there when he was born. He's going to love this. I changed his diaper. <laughs> On many an occasion. I've helped him up, and by the way, I've sat him down too. I've cheered him on to give him great encouragement. Tried to. Tried to set an example before him, but we've gone through things together, and I know that young man. I know him. I know his heart. I know his desires. Matter of fact, he may think that there's some things that I don't know, but y'all who are parents, we really do, don't we? I wonder if there's some people who came to know Jesus that they got close enough maybe to shake his hand, but they never sought to follow him. I had someone say to me not too long ago, I was talking about the whisper of the Holy Spirit, and they said to me, they said, I've never heard the whisper of the Holy Spirit of God. And I said, really? I have. I know the God. Church, hear this. I know the God who can. I don't care what circumstance you're going through. I don't care what burden you have. I don't care what obstacle you're facing. I don't care how deep that cavern looks, how tall that mountain that you must climb. I'm here to tell you, God fashioned us and made us in such a way that we can know him and walk with him. I just don't know that we want to. I don't mean this to be rude, but you're as close to God as you want to be. Church, please listen. If you can live your personal life without living the revived life, you will.
if you've got a system of how you're going to think things through and just a little vaccine shot of Jesus will be enough, then that's all you're going to have. But Jesus said to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. I think some people are signing up to go to heaven because they don't want to go to hell. I mean, someone said that there'd be mansions there and streets of gold and no more sickness or heartache and pain, and it seemed like a good alternative. I think I'll have a little bit of that. But let me ask you, do you know him? Do you really? not trying to make you doubt it. I'm just trying to hold up a mirror so that you can see, see yourself. And do you really see a testimony that's alive? It bothers me that a man <laughs> seeking to honor God went to get saved and was baptized simply because a woman told him to. Or Billy Graham was a lost church member before he gave his heart in Christ to Christ. I've actually seen preachers get saved. I've seen Sunday school teachers and deacons get saved. And every one of them will tell you that their pride was the thing that was in the way. Pride, come, pride cometh before what? Say it loud, church. And I don't want that for anybody. It happened this week, this week to me because, last week really, because there was a young man that was battling addiction. <clears throat> he was 21, and I met him because of that. His dad was a great provider, great guy. His mom was sweet. She used to call me all the time. That's how I met him was because I was at Victory Home and we were trying to help him in his addiction. I taught him. I taught him in class. I taught him one-on-one. -on -one. And I could look at him and, you know, you, he could say some right things, but then there was also a little bit of a disconnect that was there, and you really didn't know if he was willing to give it up or not. And I don't know about you, but in my life, the sin that I have, it cannot be coddled. It must be repented of. Probably the same thing for you. And I learned last week that this young man, I mean a beautiful young man, smart, likable young man, overdosed, and is dead. Preacher, you're trying to scare me. No, that's just the testimony of this man, the hard facts of it. I will give you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm actually trying to just say, just check and make sure that you know him. It's worth all eternity. And if there's a voice that's making you uncomfortable, don't tell it to be quiet. Be obedient. We're as close as God as we want to be. And if we can walk without revival in our life, we will.